uh, I'll preface this by telling you that the uh, I sent you the exact video recording of the lecture I did for the earlier group, and I apologize. Uh, uh, my wife inadvertently left her car keys in my car, and so and unfortunately I had to get down here get her the car because she had stuff that she had to get home with. And it was clobbered my afternoon classes. So I, I, I know, heaven forbid, you didn't have to listen to me for another 50 minutes. We'll all get over that. So uh, housekeeping. This next test I sent you the study guide of is probably going to be on Monday, a week from Monday. The fourth. Uh, March 4th. Because I will probably get done with all the stuff the virus stuff no later than Wednesday. Uh, so my tentative plan is Monday and Wednesday to do viruses and Friday to do review and catch up on any odds and ends. That's the tentative plan. The reason is we like to get two grades in before midterm because if anybody's having substantial trouble, they do have some options then if they choose to invoke them. And <clears throat> so if at all possible, I'd like to do that. Uh, if some people, I mean, I'm not adverse, but I was, uh, someone told me in the other group that Dr. Robbins is giving a practical on the Thursday, the 7th, is that correct? Yeah. So that may impact, so I mean, if somebody, I mean, I, I'm willing to entertain people, if, I hate to have two test, two test days, uh, but so you, you think to yourselves what would be easier, the 4th or the 6th? And let me know because then I can even set aside time on the Monday. If you want to wait until the Wednesday for people who prefer to take it Monday. And while I'm doing, yes, ma'am. Oh, it's even worse. Yeah. So you better open the Monday. Yeah, we all, it's, it's fast and furious. This is what happens. And the same thing as we mean finals. We're all going to give the third exam roughly the same time, and the finals are final. Hey, <clears throat> at least we, 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 I hate to tell you what education was like prior to this enlightened age. The word study guide were not in the lexicon. So, yeah, basically, I had, when I was in medical school the first semester, and a nice kid, a good student, he goes, professor, and this was, this guy was, was the world's leading authority on the human on the anatomy of the foot and lower extremity in the world we were his last class and he goes study guide whatever we covered from the first day of, until the last whatever is in your notes whatever was in your readings anything that was mentioned in the lecture that's your study guide. period end of sentence just you sweated bullets if you had to answer a question okay all right <clears throat> Have a patho exam the day we come back in the spring. Of course. Yeah. So, so, that's okay. so much for your so on the beach, it'll be nice. Oh, and the bad yeah, news, March 8th, the Friday, you can use that to study. We're not gonna have class. Oh thanks. So you're getting it's okay? You're, you're good with that? You look you look like you're angry about it. Okay. No, we're out we're we're good with that. Uh, yeah, no, I, I will hopefully on that particular afternoon, I will be on the beach in Jackson at Mayport Beach. Are you? You'll be where? Oh, you'll be in Patham on the 8th. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so so I sent you the recording. This is uh, the last piece of that recording, was what I'm going to start with today. So really that covered that genetics is the least of the three chapters, the one that is least emphasized, but there's certain points that are particularly important. And I would rather deal with those points first than anything else. So if you look at that video, it will go over what's called transformation, which we call naked DNA from an exploded cell into another that impacts it. It looks at mismatch repair. It looks at something called homologous recombination. That means the DNA kind of knows where to go when it's kicking something out of a cell's DNA, a bacterial cell's DNA. 
mismatch repair is that 50 50 thing transduction if you look at that video it's all about a, a specific unusual virus that causes that affects bacteria not us we are infected we are not infected but affected by it indirectly because that virus conceivably could give properties to that bacteria that could be like Botox, the toxin comes from a viral infection of a bacteria just off the top of my head. And down the road, when we do the virus chapter, which comes next, there'll be a chart about that. But by far and away, the one that you have to know the most about is this one called conjugation. You can see it up there, but I'll, I'll just go right to the zip file. which I, This must be the 15th time I've downloaded it, so who cares? And it's, it, you'll find that these it unloads the file transfer of the F plasma. So that that's the one we're looking at. And this I played this. And I don't want to replay it right now, but I want to sort of narrate through it. This is how a population of staff can become MRSA overnight with one MRSA cell. It involves what are called F positive bacteria. What does that mean? It means they have what's called the F pilus and the F plasma. The big F stands for fertility. That plasmid has two things guaranteed on it. One, the information you construct, this appendage, this pilus, this protein appendage. And two, the information to transfer DNA. We'll go over the animation. I'll do it slowly and just narrate through it without letting them narrate. Because you can see it as many times as you want. But... Sometimes this, and let's say this is the case we're talking about, this F plasmid will have resistance or some other resistance or an antibiotic, uh, some other information to make a capsule, something that will enhance it. And it, that, if it has resistance to an antibiotic, by definition, we have an R plasmid. So an F plasmid can also be an R plasmid, but a resistance plasmid, another plasmid, there can be many more than one in a cell are not necessarily F plasmids. And the interesting thing about this process of conjugation, it's a one-time deal. It takes two to four minutes. And as soon as that plasmid goes to the other cell, it stops. Because now that becomes F positive and the two F positives can't exchange genetic information. So it's a one opportunity for the, the, this elaborate, interesting exchange of genetic material that's there. And the reality is, that once it becomes F positive, that's a stable change that replicates along with it. So the entire population, bacteria, every 20 to 30 minutes, you're making a new new set, will become F positive overnight. There'll be no more of the ones without called F negative. And if that and if this one had MRSA, and this had methicillin resistance as the property, it would go to the other. And you also note that it's not as though we're taking this apart and moving it. It's not as though, remember, a single strand that you will see on the outside comes over. What's interesting about that is it's continually remade or resynthesized. It's never without that circle of DNA because the minute it's incomplete, it's no longer F positive and the whole transfer of genetic material stops. So it's a very, it's well understood and it's used extensively. So in this case, the typical F plasma, there are some exceptions that we use in genetic engineering, are is not associated with the chromosome. Again, it has the information to affect, basically affect the transfer and make that F pilus. So there, there's billions of cells, in, whether it's an infection, whether it's in a milieu someplace, anywhere, they're likely to come in contact. And if they and if it strikes a receptor, as you will see here. It will bind to it, and the cells will be drawn into close proximity. That starts, that opening or passageway is big enough for multiple plasmids to move through. So it's not limited to one. The F plasma will go through, and anything else that gets through, gets through. Okay. There are other cases where there's too much information to get through, but they, again, that's more of genetic engineering. The area outlined in red on my left as I'm looking at it, as you're looking at it, it's called the origin of transfer. We use that in genetic engineering because that's the part that we know is going to get through. 
we can splice traits or splice information to make a protein like insulin to that area and be assured that it will transfer. So that's, and that's a consistent finding because we know what's uh, what the ends are like that are there. So we can make something and it doesn't matter. It's an endonuclease. It's just a fancy term for an enzyme. And this is the very famous rolling circle mechanism. What it does means it's the outer strand moves, but it's continually remade. So this never disappears. Once the entirety of that outer strand goes in circles and reproduces the, it's new outer. We know this is the originally, this was the inner strand that outer strand. And once it makes it now, another strand to be outside of it. Now we have an F plasma and both. And at that point it stops two, four minutes, not long. Once it stopped, they separate. And once they separate at this point in time, now they're both F positive. That's basically what happens. So now when these replicate again, you'll have four. Those four will infect four F negative cells. That'll make eight. When they replicate again, it's 16. So it doesn't take long for we go from two to 16 to 256. Just keep squaring the number. I, I, I know a lot of, I like squares. It's a math thing. Always fascinated by numbers. So that's conjugation. There's only one other animation to look at in this particular sequence. And it's not this one. And that's the one that we saw initially that was in the discussion about uh, the, what I used to call Indian corn. I know it's not acceptable. Native American corn we used to put on our, you know, the full, where, where the, the researcher couldn't figure out a reason for those repeat patterns. And so it was called, and so we're doing transposition is what this is. And it shows it to you relatively clearly. No, nope, wrong one. So think as I dumb I am. I stop. Never mind. Simple. And you can listen to this. Uh oh, uh oh. I've got the wrong one. I'm so sorry, everybody. Uh, for goodness sake, Lou. I had the right one before. Here it is. Why don't you help me out here? Transposons are segments of DNA that are capable of shifting from one location to another. A transposon enters the cell by being carried on a plasma. A transposon can then move from the plasma into the host cell genome. A transposon can move from one site on the host genome to another site on the host genome. When some transposons move, they replicate, leaving a copy in the original position. A transposon can also move from the host genome to a plasmid. done it's done rather abbreviated so all is basically showing you that the plasmid can easily make it move in and move out of the cell it can pick up and it can replicate under and this, this is how when barbara mcclintock did those studies how she could it's the only way she could make sense out of the repeat patterns and now we see them so they do play a role not to, and all you have to know is that they, they, they we, you know, typically we refer to them as jumping genes and they can create replicatable in different areas along the strand of DNA. They play a more pivotal role when we get to antibiotics about the development of what's called vancomycin resistant staphylococcus aureus, which is a very serious infection 
And a lot of it came, we suspect, from this particular mechanism adversely, you know, something we didn't lose necessarily. So I'll take us out of that. And that really concludes a lot of the material for that particular chapter that's there. So I won't have to do it. And the next chapter we do is really viruses. So today, this is introductory and background information. Should be looking at that. And this is Cowan's chapter five. And at the very end, like it does, it goes to prions. We'll also use the charts from the Nestor chapter a little bit. And really my focus on this is not to go into a tremendous amount of detail about the disease, but give you some background about how we identify viruses. We basically have three ways we categorize them. We look at how they spread as well. And then we'll look a little bit into the different disease entities that are caused, you know, representative of certain categories, like where the common cold comes from. We'll talk more about what it does to our systems in the second half of the course, where we look at the more clinical basis of the disease. You know, someone has the measles, someone has influenza, someone has COVID. What actually is happening? What can we do about it? Or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So this is more of the introductory, more of the, uh, to a certain amount, anatomy and some basic physiology of viruses, if we can call it that, because they're not living things. And we go on from there. So that's really the next chapter. And it'll take me about three good lectures, plus maybe some odds and ends to take care of it. And as you know, they affect, they infect everything. If it's living, a virus can get it. As I said, a lot of times what makes certain bacteria toxic or dangerous, they have a virus. Not unlike you or I. Uh, it's a startling number when you can think of a, a milliliter. I mean, that's like 20 drops of seawater, 15 to 20 drops. Could have 10 million viruses. That's why I'll probably stay on the beach and not go in. I'm joking. Okay. And Pasteur was the original one who basically knew he couldn't identify a bacteria for rabies. So he speculated it was a tiny bacteria. And he coined the name virus for poison. But the reality was it wasn't a bacteria at all. And by our current definition, we have a non-living entity. And we really classify them as either active or inactive or inert or active. There's various terms depending on the author. And it, it, it's really significant that if we began to understand things that were causing a lot of problems. The earliest ones to study are the ones that impacted us economically. Prior to certainly uh, the turn of the, from the, from the 1800s to the 1900s, okay, the last major century change, our economies were very agrarian. They were based on, again, cattle and food and plants and tobacco was a major industry. And, you know, basically we, we, we were dealing with technology or computers or internet or anything like that, obviously. I mean, that's just 150 years ago, let's say, arbitrarily. The biggest cash crop in the world was tobacco. And tobacco mosaic was really the first virus that damaged that crop. And that was an economic tragedy. I mean, great wars were fought over tobacco. If you go back and look historically, the Spanish Armada, that fight with England was about tobacco. England had, they, 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 wanted, they, they wanted in on the tobacco industry. There's an old saying, it's about the money. And food and, food and mouth disease, even though it affects us almost minimally, if though you're exposed to this virus, I mean, it's killing cattle, and, and now you're doing food supply. Uh, filterable is not a big deal for us, I don't think. But really, they were, what, what identified it was filters were created and viruses got through. And so they called them filterable viruses because the filtrate remained infectious. And I, 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 that's not a term I'm really concerned about. So they're not organisms, they're not made of cells. I know there's evolutionary stuff. It's not my area of expertise. We'll talk about their characteristics. 
we'll talk about how they can be so deadly potentially. And this is a very big nugget part of this. If you take all the authors of textbooks on micro and you averaged out, and this is about an average of, well, how many cancers are directly caused by a virus infection? The number that affect us, 15 to 30 percent. That's one sixth to about one third of all cancers. And surely the majority of those are human papillomavirus and its impact on cervical carcinoma. Yes. Can you say the percentage one more time? 15 to 30. One five dash three oh. I know 15 sounds like 50. <laughs> Thank you. It's all right. My wife has a colloquial expression indicating I'm talking out of my anal orifice, which I will not repeat here. Right? So, virus is in a major connection. And it's not all HPV. Uh, there are, cancers are caused by herpes. There's plenty of cancers that are out there that are directly related to viruses. Most liver cancers are all viral. So I, I don't, I, to me, it's not a debate because it's, I mean, that's, that's a topic people want to debate for fun. You know, it, it, what they are is they're, where they are become active when they enter a cell and they basically take over the cell's machinery. That was a, you go back and watch that animation about transduction where a virus is the vector taking genetic material from one bacteria to another. That's what it does. It takes over the cell. Okay, so it can, and it, it isn't limited in how it happens. That's a misconception. All viruses don't behave the same way. Some just multiply inside cells until they're enormous at first and then infect other cells. Others take over the cell and turn it into a little factory that continually makes viruses. You may get over a viral infection. Your cell will never. Your cell has two options. It will either be permanently changed or it will die. It never gets better. The normal cell never returns. It's a forever altered cell. And thankfully, they don't survive very long. But there are some that turn into factories that reproduce viruses that make more altered cells. And certainly the most common one of these, not common, but the most notable one of these is human deficiency virus, HIV leading to AIDS. So it, 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 these, these aren't great. Okay, they obviously had an evolutionary role because 8% of our genome, basically sequences that we've identified in viruses, 10 to 20% of bacterial DNA. So we know there's been an impact from it, from a standpoint of evolution, exactly how a method is not. The best thing we can describe this, and it's not limited to viruses. Some bacteria are obligate intracellular parasites. Obligate means it has to be there to survive. Intracellular is just that. It lives inside the cell. Parasites means it's doing harm. So effectively, once it enters the cell, by whatever means, of whatever organism, either simple or multi, single or multi-celled, it begins to effectively, and again, the animation showed it for transduction, it destroys the host cell's DNA, or at the very least, it alters that DNA and basically causes a takeover. All of a sudden it's been invaded, it's changed, it hijacks the protein making mechanisms, it hijacks the energy making mechanisms and schools out. So as you can see, they're all like that. I, I, I can't even imagine a number that big so I don't even talk about it. First time I saw it in this particular PowerPoint sequence, that's 10 with, uh, 10 with what? 31 zeros after it, that's a lot of zeros. They are everywhere. They're extraordinarily small. If a bacteria had a microscope, it would be like, it would be very often, it would be looking for viruses like you would look in the microscope in the lab. And you're magnifying that a thousand times. So maybe there, many of them are a thousand times or more or less rather, you know, we do it's more than back to, and you know how hard it is to see that E. coli or that stab under the microscope when you stain it. It's not easy. Okay. 
So, and they're everywhere, as I said, compact and economical because they're not made of cells. At a minimum, they are this genetic material in a protein shell, period. That's the minimum of it is. Additionally, we covered this earlier in the first class, the first lecture material, first lecture material. DNA or RNA never both say it a thousand times. I don't worry so much about strandedness. There's a couple of issues where I'll talk about it. But remember, we have double-stranded DNA and single-stranded RNA in living things. The virus can have all of these. They are very specific for attachment. You're going to see shortly that they have what are called protein spikes. That's how they attach. And it's all, again, it's like a specific lock and a specific key. You can't take a generic skeleton key and attach to anything. So a virus that causes, uh, that's sexually transmitted, can probably only adhere to lining cells in the, in, in, in the male or female sexual passageway. So if you get that on your hands, I'm not recommending you do that. Okay, but it's theoretically, if you wash your hands appropriately or wearing gloves, there's no issue. And I'm not saying it flippantly. Because if you're a nursing, you you get your hands at your home, heaven forbid. In everything, there's no biological substance that you you won't touch or it won't touch you. Patients throw things at you, and that's as far as I'm going. Go back and look at the early phases of silence of the labs. Jody Foster, Sir Anthony. So just pointing that out. So they can't do anything on their own. They're pretty lazy. Okay. And we use the term for ones that affect us as animal viruses and the ones that affect bacteria as bacteriophage viruses, they still use that. But really, uh, I, we classify them, I classify them rather simply. And what we're going to do is I'll go, just push forward real quick to show you before I go up on the board. Those are just some of the things. Basically, we look at these, we look at different examples. And we'll classify them as DNA or RNA. And yes, we're going to look at certain names and we're going to look at certain diseases. And these are part of the classification, but not the accepted form of classification. So, again, this is back to where it is here. Again, I wanted to just push through that before I go to the board. They're the smallest. Parvovirus. Who gets parvo? Who gets immunized with parvo? Dogs is correct. Horrible, a real uh, kennel, kennel-based or, you know, a play group or daycare-based virus that causes horrible diarrhea and vomiting. Classically, we also get parvoviruses. By the way. They don't cause the same thing. Many of you had that parvovirus as a kid. doesn't mean anything because it was minor. Okay, they're very tiny. Herpes is seven and a half times bigger than that. Okay. And there's different shapes that we'll go into. So here, you're looking over here roughly at, that's polio virus. That would be in the parvo category. Parvo might be a little bit smaller. And here's your old friend E. coli, a thousand times under the microscope. So you probably have to magnify it another thousand times to be able to get any idea. So we look at the term microscope. And we do look at them. So they're quite, and I don't want to go over that slide so much. This is what electron micrographs look like. They can be somewhat linear. This is probably Ebola, which I think you may have heard of. This is probably rabies, which is in this category, but has a funnier shape. So they call it bullet shaped. And these are the most common shape. And I don't know which that, whether that's an adenovirus or not. That could be herpes. It could be anything. There's a lot of them in that category. Just to give you some ideas. And then I'll, I'll go back and, and come back to these things every so slightly as I can. I want to jump around and try to get as much as I can in the categories we want to be doing today anyway. So, plenty of time. How do we classify? Genetically. 
remember they're either DNA or RNA, so we classify them by their genetic material. So we have DNA and RNA viruses, like you saw in that chart. DNA, I don't like to paint with a broad brush in science. One thing that DNA viruses have that they do that RNA viruses don't do, they can be labeled, like a cold sore, that's a herpes virus. So when it's latent, it can sort of hide inside you, and maybe it'll come out again, maybe it won't. That's very true. That's not true for any TV. They're both DNA viruses. RNA viruses, it, I'll pick the two that do this very quite frequently. Influenza and COVID, they mutate. Because RNA replication, depending on the treatment in our cells, is relatively fraught with mistakes. It does not have the proofreading mechanism of the DNA replication. So we see, and then, I, I get sick and tired of every three months seeing an article, COVID is mutated. Yeah, that'll be something I don't. Okay. And the same thing with influenza. We have a different flu strain, series of flu strains that are going to impact us every year. We don't read a lot about it because it's relatively like COVID. An inappropriately over response. So, first category is genome. Second is its architecture. That's why I showed you this picture. Architecture, even circular is not the way they look. That's really a geometric figure. It's got a great name. It's called an icosahedral virus. An icosahedron, for you fans of solid geometry, is a 20 sided geometrically identical, 20 identical sides. It's like you know, your board game, you have eight-sided dies and ten-sided dies. Some of them actually have 20 sided dies. That's what it goes to me. Because all of the sides are identical equilateral triangles. Okay, so they all have the same, so just a triangle with all the sides are the same. Equilateral triangles, they're all made of the same proteins. We call them for short isometric. And even though they look like a die, microscopically they're so tiny, they appear more certain. Cosahedral isometric, that's probably the most common type. So the second type is the A. B is that Ebola or filamentous, or tobacco you say, or even rabies, even though it's sort of hot shoot. And C, typically we have two types. There's some variations you've seen in PowerPoint. We have complex, which are generally the ones that directly attack bacteria, or bacteria beige, or beige viruses. And something called pleiform, which is probably something that's similar to or different. It's a shape that's not really easy to categorize around these Second categorization. Third, very simple. Does it have, is it have a naked virus, which means it has no envelope, meaning it's not a membrane. Or is it an enveloped? So that's how, so HPV, for instance, is a DNA virus that's isometric and naked, or not enveloped. That's a big problem. Because non-enveloped viruses are very difficult to get rid of on surfaces. Enveloped viruses have a biological membrane, possible to virus. That and has little protein spikes, which you'll see shortly that attach them. And all you have to do is come up here and do that live with no virus. Because alcohol is one of those agents that disrupts the membrane. Have a day. We did that last night. We found a game and sold for $120. Used. So, anatomically, that protein shell and the architecture is based on that. 
is surrounds whatever the DNA or RNA. It's called the capsid. It's made of identical protein components, little circles of protein, basically in a consistent geometric arrangement. Okay, the fancy name for them is called capsimers or capsimers, depending on how you spell or pronounce it. When you combine that enclosure with genetic material, it is called a nucleocapsid. That is it for a naked or non-enveloped virus. The envelope, living membrane, that comes from the cell it came out of. It can come from the nuclear membrane. It can come from the endoplasmic reticulum. Some, most of the time it comes from the external or cell membrane, like in one of our cells. And on its way out, the cell is like a little factory. It doesn't explode, but as it as it's almost like spitting it out. And on its way out, pushed out, it gets a piece of membrane. Right? Go back and look at like exocytosis or endocytosis. We can open and close membranes. So there's no reason we can't encircle a little piece of membrane for something that's being spit out. That's what viruses do. And you'll see that the spikes that they attach with are already embedded in that membrane. So it's, it's, it's relatively easy. We call that budding or shedding. And that's one of, the, for instance, HIV works. When it infects uh, one of your, uh, what's called a helper T cell, those viruses are spit out and then can shoot around and infect other helper T cells. So again, usually a modified piece of the cell membrane, they can be from other aspects and that's how they attach. And the fancy name we get for a virus that's basically, quote, a mature virus particle is a virion. I mean, I don't actually ask about that term, but you should be familiar with it. That's a good illustration of the distinction. These are both isometric or icosahedral viruses. You can see the geometric nature either here or within the membrane. You can see the genetic material, whatever it is, DNA or RNA. You can see the spikes protrude and are attached directly to the capsid. Here, the spikes are embedded and protrude from the membrane. So, spikes only work, okay, if they're there. So, if you, the membrane isn't there, the virus is no longer an issue. So, that's one of those neat kind of uh, counterintuitive points I love. Normally, when you have an extra layer of protection, it's like, well, I'm like, let's leave it cold because I have a real thick coat on. Not here. Okay, that extra layer of protection is a target for germicides, antivirals, disinfectants. That's, and that's, I know it's, I know you're saying to yourself, well, why in heaven's name, not the way you would have described it. Do I need to know about all this stuff? Not the word you would probably have utilized for this colloquially talking among your friends. The reality is, the scientists, this is what we look at. I'm not a scientist, but you know, people who are in science. They look at all these little nuances and say, this is how it works. Now what can I do to either kill it, utilize it, extract something important from it? How can I derive benefit or limit the, the problems associated. That's what science does. So the capsid, those are the individual subunits. Very prominent. That's really the architecture is an important part. They assemble by themselves. By and large, those are the two categories. Filamentous or helical, icosahedral or isometric. That's what we look about them. Enveloped irises pick up the membrane. I don't know that that's accurate. That statement. To me, a pleomorphic is an unusual architecture that it, and it's typically enveloped. So I would to me, pleomorphic means it's some other shape. Really. So I mean the way they cat this is interesting. Here's tobacco mosaic. You can see naked virus. You can see it kind of the capsid wraps around the way you would put tape on a on a hockey stick or a baseball bat. You know, you maybe you put piping tape around or duct tape. Around. You sort of wrap it around to secure it. And you can see it's inside there. Now here, this is influenza. 
could be one of these others, measles or rabies. And you can see here the morphology or the shape is a little bit different. More flexible, okay, enveloped helical nucleocapsid. So this is in that category. Really cool. Most of the time, the way we talk about influenza is pleomorphic. Because it doesn't have just one strand, it has seven or eight strands, as you'll see down the road. So it's not a big deal right now. But it's useful for context. So here you can again see it. Here's the icosahedron, all the different parts about it. This is a very famous virus called adenovirus. Adeno means gland. So it's really like a cold virus. Okay, and when, but when you get a bad cold, a lot of times you have swollen glands. That's kind of one of the ways its name was derived. That's also a pain in the neck because cold viruses because we constantly are exposed to them, are naked viruses. They're hard to get rid of in the environment. That's why I was, you know, another one of those, you know, the mistaken approach. I'm not saying that we did a ton of things wrong, but the mistaken approach, to some degree, the overreaction of COVID had to do with the fact that it's an enveloped virus. I mean, why? What, it should not have prevented you from going to school with appropriate safeguards because they could certainly have done something in rooms in between things like that. Uh, we did it here as well. They did it again when we do restrictions like that in the case of infection, and we still incorporate it into our syllabi here. It's because our insurance company tells you, and it's just, whether it's our amuse insurance company or whatever school district. You went to my kids. My kids went to Fox Chapel. My wife's kids went to Seneca Valley. Whatever the school district is, they had you know they got together and said we got to, we have to limit liability exposure. The same thing happens in a hospital. It's all these different things. Why all of a sudden magically did UPMC start having you had to wear a mask and I didn't have to wear a mask? The insurance company said, hey, we're we're seeing an uptick. We don't want to be caught short. So we respond more to financial stressors sometimes. And this is the oddball. This is a sort of a picture. And these and that's a micrograph, so it's exactly what it looks like. This is what infects bacteria cells or something. And this is the most common type. This it is isometric with either DNA or RNA in there. All this is is how it attaches by the fibers how it stabilizes by the pins and the fibers in combination, the collar and sheath. This is nothing more than an elaborate syringe to inject the genetic material into the susceptible bacteria. You'll see there's any one of a number of these micrographs like this one where you can see an E. coli that's simply covered in these bacteriophage viruses. So that's, that's called T4. I mean, you know, other than to know, that's what we call complex more than anything else. And typically for animal viruses, when they're not in a specific architecture, we call them pleiform. So that's the genome number right away. DNA or RNA never both. Comparatively small. Hepatitis B. Before hepatitis C, it was the biggest killer of hepatitis. And we have an immunization that most people have, have gotten over time. Only four genes to potentially lead to liver cancer or death. Okay, herpes, hundreds. Okay, and whatever they need to invade and basically take over the cell is the way to describe it. I do not do the sense strands thing. I will talk about influenza with regard to why it has this interesting tendency to mutate and a little bit about COVID the same way down the road. And retrovirus is interesting because viruses, and many of them do, but, but retrovirus by far and away also packages little enzymes with it that make it so problematic. And so finally, when we get into the HIV part of the, of the program, and we do that a couple of times, it's, remember I wrote up there, DNA well, latent, RNA mutated. Well, COVID is what I call the worst of both worlds. 
It's an RNA virus, so it mutates. That's why we have to use multiple antivirals. And it's like a DNA virus because it can be latent. And if it's untreated, it takes somewhere between two and 10 years to demonstrate itself fatally as, as a syndrome we call AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, which has a lot of presentations. And so we'll stop here. Uh, I will probably go to the other chart and the other text. When we resume, we cover DNA and RNA viruses at nauseum. And remind me to tell you about how they spread. I didn't put that in, but I didn't want in four minutes. I can't do that. Thank you. If I'm on my game, I'll maybe I'll send you how they spread. So please hand those in wherever wherever you want to put them. Make a pile over there. That'll be fine. I'll deal with it from here. Too hard otherwise. Thank you.